Hello, and welcome to A Sunny Book Nook. Today, I'm gonna to be giving you my February wrap-up. I have my Valentine's Day type of strawberry fit on, so it's, it's appropriate for February, although it is now March when I'm filming this, so take that as you will. According to my reading journal, in February I read 15 books, and I'm not counting the first book that I read because I already talked about it in my January wrap-up. Of the 15 books that I finished, I read four literary fiction books, two sci-fi speculative fiction books, three historical fiction novels, three short story collections, one mystery thriller, one graphic novel slash comic, and one nonfiction book. In terms of star ratings, I gave one book five stars, one book 4.5 stars, five books four stars, four books 3.5 stars, and four books three stars. So a generally kind of more mediocre month for me. I'm not the kind of person who reads a lot of one to two star books. So the fact that the median like variation leans more towards the three end of things and 3.5 end of things kind of, I don't know, I think in general it was kind of a mid reading month for me. In terms of audience, all 15 of the books that I read were for adult, were written for adults. And in terms of format, the large majority of them were via audiobooks, checked out from my library, so 13 of them were audiobooks. One was a physical book and one was an ebook, which I think I got off Scribd. And then to get into author demographics, I read one white author, 12 black authors, one Asian author, and one Latin American author. Um, and it was Black History Month in the US, so that was why I tried to focus mostly on black authors. And in terms of author gender, I read 14 books by women and one book by man. So yeah, that is the kind of the stats that I have. Let's just get into the books that I read. And as usual, I'm going to go over these in the order that I read them. The first book that I read that wasn't the book that I talked about in uh, my January wrap up was Brown Girls by Daphne Palasi Andreads. Andreads. I gave this book 3.5 stars because it is kind of a bit more diaspora poetry-ish, but it takes on this collective voice of like us being brown girls, girls of various diasporas who grow up in Queens and you know their life as they go through childhood and girlhood up until adulthood and then all the different phases of like adolescence and doing things basically, like everything that coming of age entails and then what it means to like get out of the hood or stay in there or like you know become a professional in whatever capacity um your relationship to your parents and your community members it was very much interrogating that but I don't think it was necessarily saying anything that hasn't already been said before if that makes sense and for that reason it was sort of a mid-reading experience. I think that there were explorations of identity and queerness and coming of age that were done pretty well for what they were but it just ne wasn't necessarily my cup of tea. Cup of tea. I think that a lot of people would really enjoy this and I'm in the definite minority of people who don't think it is that great. I mean, not to say that I didn't like it, I did like it, but it's just not a standout. I'm probably not gonna really remember that much about it. I mean, the cover is really beautiful. The next book that I read in the month of February was a historical fiction novel called Zori by Laird Hunt. Wait, is Laird Hunt a man? Laird Hunt is a man, so I didn't read 14 women and one man. I read 13 women and one man. Anyway, so Zori is about this old woman, and we kind of... Well, okay, she ends up being an old woman by the end of the story, but we follow her coming of age from sort of like the Great Depression type vibes. Like, it's basically a, his, a really expensive historical fiction novel that's really tender and sweet and very much about, like, middle America, which I'm from the Midwest and the South-ish, and so I just, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was such a sweet book that really was about love and friendship and what life can really be about and the quiet tenderness that Zori possesses and exudes and experiences and the various communities she gets involved with and the fact that she is one of the radium girls like her life because it's so long and expansive we see her go experience all these things across history that 
feel humanized, you know, because she ends up working at a factory where the Radium Girls, if you don't know, it's a part of history that basically there is a whole phase, this whole big trend where Radium was seen as this cure-all treatment for everything and it was used to paint a bunch of like dials. The Radium craze kind of you know, obviously radium isn't good for you. Like, it gave a bunch of bitches cancer. It wasn't great. And especially vulnerable were the young women who were working in factories painting radium onto shit. So Zori was one of those people, but that's not even a massive part of the story. It's honestly kind of a minor element to it. It's just one of the many things that makes her Zori. So it is just this tender historical fiction novel that follows to the present, but it doesn't feel contemporary, if that makes sense. All right, the next book that I read was Recessative by Toni Morrison with the foreword written by Zadie Smith. I have never read the short story before and this is the first time it's been published in its own book um, as opposed to like in as a part of collections or anything. And this was actually recommended to me on my podcast by my co-host because part, if you don't listen to my podcast, Lavender Menace, you should. It's a three-part variety show. It's like comedy, media commentary, media analysis, political analysis from like a lesbian, communist lens, whatever, whatever. Anyway, part of our three-part variety show is that our third part is us recommending each other media. And for our episode on passing, the adaptation of the Nella Larson novel, which I've talked about on this channel before, in the recommendations portion, or when we were discussing the movie Renaissance, my co-host was kind of telling me that this movie and you know passing reminds them of recessive as a short story because it is also a, this playing with who is white and who is black and what delineates these identities but i think that the zadie smith introduction was really interesting because it kind of gave a cultural and historiographical and like biographical picture of Morrison's work and then the way it was received. Although I do think that some of Zadie Smith's political commentary in the introduction, uh, I I just thought that it was kind of not, <laughs> not it in a way that a lot of, I think, progressive seeming liberal writers are in this way. I don't know. Like, Regardless, I do think that this is a wonderful short story, of course. Ever. It's it's Toni Morrison, like, what can you say? She's just one of the best writers ever. So, like, this short story was phenomenal and it was a really, like, necessary read for me to get to at some point. So I'm glad I did get to it and I do think that it was really interesting. And because I read the introduction to this before reading the actual short story, my approach was less so trying to puzzle out which character was white and which character is black because if you don't know the premise of the story basically it's a short story following two girls who grew up in this like orphanage foster care system and then we see them throughout their lives but you don't know which one is white and which one is black but we get glimpses into their lives so you could try to parse it out but because i knew that this was the case like i wasn't as interested in trying to know or I f definitively identify which character is white, which character is black, because Morrison herself probably doesn't know, and she didn't have that intention while writing it. What like was to crack the puzzle of who is who? It's it, like the question itself is what reveals something about the reader. So yeah, I I really thought that it was brilliant. Um, but I rated it four stars because the Zadie Smith introduction, parts of it just made me. Ugh, I was just like, this is this is not it, and but regardless, the next book that I read was a short story collection called Kabu Kabu by Nadia Korfor. I've read so much Nadia Korfor in the past couple years, like it's kind of crazy. I think a lot of her work is really solid. Some of it feels kind of repetitive, and I think that was my issue with Kabu Kabu. A lot of the short stories felt like stuff that I've read from her before, or stuff that within the short story collection itself like didn't feel cohesive or it felt kind of uneven in I guess but there were some short stories that I was like this is fire bro like I love this so much but a lot of them were kind of meh for me didn't really stick out to me in any particular way but again like Nadia Korfor is really masterful at dealing with themes of like family and relationship marriage dynamics as well as this Afrofuturist sort of like environmental and social and political perspective in 
sci-fi. So, you know, it's, it's a good read, but I rated it 3.5 stars. The next book that I read was Like a Sister by Kelly Garrett. This book I got through the Libro FM Influencer audiobook program and I thought it was okay. I only gave it three stars. If you've been subscribed to me for a while, which you should subscribe if you aren't already. If you've been watching me for a bit, you probably know that I'm not the kind of person who gives out low star ratings because three stars is just like okay for me. Meh to good is sort of the vibes. 3.5 is like good. Right, four is like, like pretty, pretty, really great. I really enjoyed it. Five is like a stunning, amazing, blew me away, right? So because of that, I don't, and because I know my tastes, I don't really read a lot of two to one star books, but three is sort of like pretty low for me because I already skew in that direction, if that makes sense. Anyway, this book is a three star book for me because it is a mystery thriller-ish about this woman whose sister was like this reality show influencer. She dies under mysterious circumstances and our main character is trying to investigate what actually happened. Her dad has is like a major producer in the music industry but her dad like sort of left her when she was young. They don't really have a relationship but this book tries to explore the tension of that dynamic in the aftermath of her sister's death, as well as her trying to navigate working with and against the police who are also, you know, just saying, oh, she's just like an addict, like whatever. So I thought that it was paced kind of poorly. It felt kind of repetitive at points. I think that the writing style was also not something that I was the biggest fan of. I love a cozy, whimsical, funny, leaning mystery thriller or stuff that's like really hardcore and intense like I'm thinking an example of like the cozy type is Finley Donovan is killing it or Fortune Favors the Dead by Stephen Spotswood which is one of my favorite reads of 2020 or like really intense thrillers like They Never Learn, Lane Fargo or Pretty Girls, Karen Slaughter. This book it felt like it wasn't it, it was just so plain it felt kind of toneless almost I don't know. I think that people would like it though. I think my understanding of it is just because I'm a particular kind of reader. I think most thriller mystery readers or people who really like the genre or people who are interested in it or interested in the premise of the story of like your estranged family members and the what happens in the aftermath of a tragic death. If you're interested in that thematically, I think you're gonna enjoy this. The next book that I read was Escaping Exodus by Nikki Drayden and this is a sci-fi fantasy novel that is set in space many many years in the future like a, several millennia and in this world humanity lives in these beasts so these like giant space creatures and like societies basically like live inside of them using the power that they have and using them as ships basically and we're following a couple different characters in here who are all loosely related to each other or have really tenuous relationships in terms of a political social and familial and romantic dynamic like all these different people I thought that it was kind of hard to follow for me but maybe that's because I'm I'm not back in the groove in the swing of things in terms of reading like fantasy especially like more epic space opera type shit so maybe I just didn't really pick up on all the correct things I mean I def I know I definitely didn't pick up on everything because I didn't fully understand it but it's a matriarchal kind of structure we're following someone whose mother is the queen or like the empress or whatever of the ship and she's gonna you know ascend to the throne the characters were not that compelling to me the relationships dynamics and the different political discourses that the book is trying to get at thematically, I didn't really necessarily fuck with. But I do think that it is a well-constructed sci-fi fantasy. Like, I think if you're a fantasy reader, you would enjoy this. So, I don't know, I can, I can see its attributes, but I also didn't personally enjoy it to the extent that I wish I did. So, I rated it three stars. The next book that I read was Milk, Blood, Heat by Dantel Moniz. This is a short story collection dealing a lot with girlhood and race, coming of age, identity. A lot of really, I mean, okay, I thought it was really, really good when I was reading it. It's four stars for me. It feels very contemporary and literary in a way that a lot of short story collections do right now. Like, 
now that I'm thinking back on it, a lot of these short stories were not that memorable to me, but maybe that's because I read so many fucking short story collections. But yeah, I read it at four stars after right after I read it because I just knew that the writing was very good, very solid and incisive. And it seems like the kind of book that if you enjoyed Danielle Evans' The Office of Historical Corrections, you would probably really enjoy this book as well. And because I really like The Office of Historical Corrections, that's why I'm saying this. But now that I'm thinking about it, like, memory loss about this book and like what had the different stories that happened in it but yeah there's a lot of I think thematically it also touches on grief and motherhood and family ties and stuff the next book that I read was The Days of Afrikiti by Sally Solomon this book is about a black lesbian who goes to Bryn Mawr but we kind of <laughs> we jump I'm laughing because it's a funny book like it's absurd but real and like funny. It's not absurd in a camp way, it's absurd in like a life way, if that makes sense. Basically, in this book, we are following our main character who at like Bryn Mawr is, gets introduced to like the dyke culture and <laughs> it's like a whole thing, right? But that is in flashbacks, kind of. Like the chapters sort of alternate. The initial opening chapter and the initial premise of the story is that this woman, our main character, is hosting a dinner party, but she has an underlying sense of tension because her husband, who was running for political office, is like getting busted by the fucking FBI or something. And so this whole dinner party that she's hosting, she's like really nervous about and all of her friends and stuff. And now that she's like a white collar, like wife of a lawyer type, woman like the black woman with a white husband in the suburbs or not the suburbs but the upper class upper middle class community and and part of philly i thought that it was interesting it was really interesting it was really smart it was really funny but in a way that wasn't like pretentious in any of those things it, it felt really real and yeah i it kind of reminded me of the watermelon woman the movie which me and renaissance discuss on our podcast but on patreon so you should become a patron if you want to support me or the podcast and or the podcast both it, it'll it supports me and renaissance regardless so anyway but yeah it reminds me of the watermelon woman which is like a classic black lesbian film in that it's sort of a meta narrative but it's also about identity and relationships and conflict and it's set in like philly so yeah i rated this book four stars the next book that i read was the mothers by Britt bennett i read and really enjoyed the vanishing half like last year or the year before that i forgot when it came out but anyway the mothers was her debut novel and it came out like a while back it got a lot of praise and hype when it did and i was kind of like mm, meh that i pass it at the library and be like whatever but when i actually read it this year this month this past month I was like this is kind of fire like this this is good because it uh, I I enjoyed the collective voice of the mothers because it's centered around this like church in this like surf town in California and in this church there's all this drama and gossip and whatever but we're mainly following our main character who is this teen girl whose mother died by suicide and whose father is now very reserved and they have a very tense tenuous relationship also the lighting is changing and shifting so much it's because it's cloudy out and like you know shit is shit is moving around so and the mothers our main character ends up fucking the pastor's son and named Lucas, I think. And so they end up having a little secret affair, hashtag illicit affairs, Taylor Swift, and she gets pregnant. And obviously it's like a church. So because of that, she the, all this drama ends up playing out. There's these complex female friendships and intimacy versus the dynamics of like these heterosexual relationships. We follow her throughout her young adulthood and then her adulthood. And then we get glimpses into the perspectives of Lucas's life who Lucas is like a football guy but he gets injured of course we get the the voice of the mothers and the we voice which I love when that shit happens in books like that's why I love we write upon sticks by Quan Berry so much anyway this book it felt very like Celeste Ng-esque if that makes sense it reminded me of Little Fires Everywhere a lot because it is about a community and what ends up happening when secrets 
and drama that isn't just drama because it's like real shit gets out. So I really enjoyed this and I rated it 4.5 stars because it didn't have that five star buzz. It didn't, it didn't give me a five star vibe, but I objectively very good and personal experience solid. The next book that I read was another three star and that was Revival Season by Monica West. This book follows a young girl who is the daughter of a pastor who is like an evangelical type Baptist. Like they travel every year around the south doing their revivals in which he is like a healer. So he has like healing powers by the grace of God or whatever. And so like all these people would come, will come to his services for the purpose of getting blessed and healed by him. But shit starts going awry when at one revival, the pastor's like anger issues come out and he like throws this pregnant girl onto the ground basically. Throughout the course of the book, we see him lose a grip on his spiritual powers basically and also we see him as an abusive patriarchal figure that he is through the eyes of this child who is his daughter and it was a very powerful and moving narrative in like not in the writing but in the concept and in the premise right because we're seeing this young girl who by the way ends up understanding that she herself has healing powers this young girl who's so immersed in her faith that she was raised in and her mother who is also stuck in this abusive dynamic with the husband and the pastor but you know they're all they're all stuck there so it's very hard hitting and it deals with the questions of like faith with a little bit of magical realism involved because these people can heal people i don't know i think that because we're in a juvenile sort of perspective because it's a young girl it isn't it, it's it's powerful in that way but i think it was kind of limiting in scope and repetitive because she is a young girl so the next book that i read was a non-fiction book which is we do this till we free us abolitionist organizing and transformative justice by mariam kaba which i rated five stars this was my only five star read of the month and for good reason this is a collection of not necessarily essays, but some essays, some transcribed interviews, and other published articles of Maryam Kaba, who is a fantastic abolitionist survivor justice organizer. And I've met her actually, and been to one of her live talks. It was amazing. She's so incredible. But this book is a really foundational introduction, I think, to contemporary abolition movements. And, you know, if you actually care about racial justice and mass incarceration and the violence of racial capitalism, like, this is the type of book that you need to read. You, like, you can't just be reading those liberal memoir type how not to, how to not be racist books. Like, you need to actually be engaging with this type of material in my opinion and it's written so simply and so succinctly because Maryam Kava herself doesn't think of herself as like a writer so she's not writing to write she's writing because there's something really important and key to in what is being communicated and it sort of answers the questions of okay well what does a world without police and prisons even look like how do we get rid of carceral logic and what even is carceral logic and how do we answer the questions of and how do you address the inevitable questions that arise with well what do you what happens in a world without police and prisons to like the bad people right and the people who rape and kill and whatever and i think that this book really explores what all these questions even mean and where they're coming from as well as actually breaking them down and addressing them in their completion with complexity and nuance and care that those types of questions deserve. Fantastic. The next book that I read was the only book that I physically read this past month which was Blood Child by Octavia Butler. This is a short story collection and it's fantastic. I rated it four stars because there were some in here that I didn't think were as good but there were some in here that were fucking amazing. Like, my favorites are Blood Child, I really loved The Evening and the Morning and the Night, Speech Sounds, Amnesty, and the essays at the end. Octavia Butler is like literally the blueprint in terms of science fiction and fantasy writing for like dystopian writing and 
speculative fiction writing, weird fiction writing. Like she's, she's always been that girl. You know what I mean? Like she is so insightful and incisive and precise in her writing. And the essays at the end, she kind of talks about being literally the only black woman sci-fi writer like on the scene when she was you know during like the mid to late 20th century and her advice to writers and stuff it was really cool so yeah this was a really solid read the next book that i finished in the month of february was dead dead girls harlem renaissance mystery at number one by nikisa afia this book is i had such high expectations for it because it's sapphic during the harlem renaissance which is such an awesome setting of history it's like a mystery and I thought it was gonna be cozy and whimsical and stuff but I wanted it to be like fortune favors the dead and kind of like that but it really it really wasn't that it was not what I expected or wanted and then what I got wasn't necessarily something that I enjoyed that much but I do think there were a lot of elements of the story that I did really enjoy that you know made it like a 3.5 star read for me we're following our main character who is known as like the savior of Harlem or something like that. I'm forgetting the exact title, but basically when she was 16, she got kidnapped and with a bunch of other girls in her area. And then she like saved them from their, their fate of being kidnapped. <laughs> um, but then something happens where the cafe that she works at, she lives in like a boarding room house with her GF and like a bunch of other girls. But yeah, basically a bunch of these murders keep on happening where the bodies will just show up in front of the door and she gets like blackmailed into working with the police it i just think that there were a lot of elements of this story that felt redundant and it could have been sharper i just think there were a lot of things about it that could have been better but there's a lot of focus on like familial dynamics and relationships and interpersonal emotional things which makes sense and is good but and like every night she goes out dancing but I just it what it didn't grip me in a way that I really wanted it to and that I expect mysteries to get me especially historical mysteries especially when there's like a sapphic plotline like I just I want it to be good so bad but I think that this it was kind of mid I gave it a 3.5 star so and the last book that I read in the month of February was a comic called bread and butter beautifully illustrated very short and it's kind of just about being in artist and going to LA or not LA living in San Francisco and like what it's like to be of that city I thought it was fine I rated it three stars it's it's again short so there's not as much content to judge necessarily and it wasn't something that blew me out of the water or knew I knew was going to stick with me so and it wasn't as good as some other short graphic novels that I've read so it, it was a three star for me but okay so I said I read 15 books in February which is true but there's one book that I finished at the very beginning well not but like like right past midnight, pretty I'm pretty sure, of the end of March 1st, basically, and that was The Perishing by Natasha Dayon. So I'm just counting it for a February read. I gave it 3.5 stars. It kind of bounces around in time, and it's about a black woman who sort of embodies a bunch of these different characters and identities and stuff across time. It was really fascinating as an idea and as a concept, and I think there were elements of it that were really fleshed out very very well but there were other elements that like really dragged and then the way that it all converged at the end I wasn't really totally convinced and our main character's kind of like approach and attitude I was kind of like I don't I don't know <laughs> so yeah anyway that is the actual last book that I read in the month of February but that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if any of the books that I read in February sound interesting to you or if you've read any of them. And if you have read any of these, let me know your thoughts. I am interested. So yeah, like, subscribe, you know, whatever, from your own Goodreads, all that bullshit. <laughs> and again, thank you for watching. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.